Uh, the actual exam uh, is going to be two hours. Okay, uh, you're going to have uh, more time. Uh, it will ha it will have obviously uh, slightly more questions, but still there will be enough time for you to to think calmly and to to answer your questions uh, within a reasonable time frame. Again, I repeat, uh, in your exam and in your exam papers, please try to be clean, okay? Produce a clean paper. Don't, uh, you know, uh, when you write things down, try to make, you know, good letters, you know, uh, good font and so on. Don't mess your, uh, mess your scripts with a lot of uh, drawings that are necessary and so on, okay? And uh, let's get started with the answers. So question number one, what is the effect of the molecular weight on the glass position based on the Flory-Fox equation? You remember we have a graph based on the Flory-Fox equation where the glass transition and the molecular weight have a relationship that looks like that, okay? And after that, there is a saturation here and a plateau. So up to, let's say, a point up to here, the glass transition continuously increases. And this point here is at 20,000 grams per mole, okay? So the correct answer is C. Increase of the molecular weight leads to an increase of the glass transition temperature up to 20,000 grams per mole, okay? <coughs> now, question number two. What is the reason for the observation of flux after the injection molding temperature? Flux is the, uh, um, the phenomenon of the injection molding where we have uh, um, extra material, okay? And uh, obviously, if we want to have a perfect uh, product, we need to get rid of these uh, extra material. The observation of flux is due to overpacking of the mold, okay? Overpacked means that we have uh, excess Okay Question number three Which is one of the parameters that enable control of the phase structure of a blob copolymer? Um, it's quite obvious that the correct answer is the Flory-Huggins interaction parameters Parameter. All the others are, are uh, completely irrelevant. Um, but it's not only the flory Haggis interaction parameter. We also said plus uh, A, let's say, degree of polymerization is very important. He and B. Um, also the uh, composition of the copolymer, okay? How much of each phase of, of each monomer have within the copolymer? So the composition. Let's say F to A, F of A. That's why you remember we have the phase structure of, uh, of a block of polymer has uh, the form like the, the form that looks like that, where in the y-axis we have the flory huggins interaction parameter times the degree of polymerization, and the x-axis we have the composition of the copolymer. Okay, and we have um, graphs that look like that, depending on the composition and depending on this product. Okay, this is the let's say phase diagram. Now, question number four, the correct dimensions of in the polymer structure here from large to smaller dimensions. Obviously, if you see larger dimensions, you see polymer seed is the obvious larger one. And then we move on to spherulites, lamellae, and the polymer chain. Okay? Question number five. What are two experimental methods that can be used in order to obtain information on the viscosity of a polymer sample? The correct, correct answer is D in this case. 
rheometry and melt flow index. Rheometry, we mentioned it, uh, uh, when was it? Last Thursday? Or a rheology, is also called rheology. Uh, we discussed that it has a, rheology has a lot of geometries, is the most uh, accurate way of uh, obtaining um, uh, in a laboratory environment the um, information on the viscosity of a polymer sub, um, sample. The most accurate And generally, there are two uh, main methods of uh, um, studying rheology. We either have a constant temperature and we variate, variate the, uh, variate the uh, frequency of the vibration, or we uh, keep the frequency constant and we, we vary it, we do a temperature scan, okay? And the melt flow index, you, you remember, it's the most practical, let's say, me method. Can anyone tell me the relationship of the melt flow index with uh, viscosity? Does anyone remember? How is the uh, melt flow index related to the viscosity? Anyone? Please text me on WeChat or Oh no, I'm, I'm always saying wrong. wrong. We come. Haven't learned it. Indeed, very well, guys. It's inversely proportional. So the melt flow index is approximated to the inverse of the viscosity. Okay. So a high melt flow index means a low viscosity. Question number six. What is the relationship between viscosity and molecular weight above the molecular weight between entanglements? We said that the graph of, that is the logarithm of the molecular weight, and that is the logarithm of the viscosity, the, logar the, the graph of viscosity versus molecular um, looks like that. Okay, in this area here, the viscosity is proportional to the molecular weight, while in the other area, which is above the molecular weight between entanglements, we have a relationship where the molecular the viscosity is proportional to the molecular weight to the power of 3.4, okay? So the correct answer is A, okay? Simple. That is why uh, a simple increase uh, in, uh, in the viscosity above the molecular weight between entanglements can lead to a, a very, uh, uh, so, sorry, a, a small increase in the molecular weight above the molecular weight between entanglements can lead to a very pronounced increase in viscosity. Uh, question number seven. A polystyrene sample has a number average molecular weight of, okay, of course, I have, I have missed uh, grams per mole everywhere, everywhere. Uh, has a number average molecular weight of 100,000 grams per mole and a polydispersity index of 5. What is the weight average molecular weight? We have already talked that the polydispersity index is usually called PDI and is given by this simple ratio of the weight average molar mass over the number average molar mass. So from this equation, the molecular weight average molar mass is 500,000 is 
500,000 grams per mole. Okay. Correct answer is C. So far, so good. I hope so. Everything is relatively simple till now. Uh, what is the average value of the end-to-end -end distance of a chain of 100 freely hinged and jointed monomer units, each of which has a length of 4 angstrom? Um, let me see what did you answer. Let me put this in the poll. I'm curious about that because um, in the past question number 8, a, B, C, and D. In the past, um, usually people were uh, confused about this question, where, where they shouldn't. Question 8, A, Let me see your answers on 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 week week Give me a second to turn off the radiator. It's so so warm in here. Let me check your answers. Pretty well, I'd say. Only 41 votes. Anyone else? No, we have more. I'll give you 30 more seconds. OK. So, 69 of 69% uh, of um, what's the group? The polymer group said D, which is in, uh, indeed the correct answer. Yes. Let me check. No, that that was yeah, that was the polymer group. Let me check the materials group as well. Ooh, 90%. Very well. Indeed. Uh, the correct answer is D. For the angstrom. This comes as a result of the use of uh, the random walk walk model. Where we have a freely jointed chain. Okay, in this case, uh, relationship between distance and length is this one for the angstrom okay uh, you can explain uh, expect that uh, in some uh, multiple choice questions in in the real exam you might have to do some very uh, kind of simple questions okay it's not Certain, but you might need to do something like like that one, that question. Now, um, the crystallization temperature of nucleated polypropylene is typically C, 20, 20 degrees higher than that of non-nucleated polypropylene. Okay, we said that we we usually add nucleating agents in order to uh, accelerate the crystallization process. And by accelerating the crystallization process, we uh, make the, the polymer matrix crystallize at higher temperatures. Okay. The graph example look like that for an example look that
The units of viscosity are Newton times seconds second, um, uh, over uh, the square of meters, okay? One Newton times second per meter equals to one Pascal times second. But we also said one Pascal times second is equal to 10 quads as well, okay? And these are the units of viscosity. Now, let's go to uh, figure and sort answer questions. Uh, let me use the uh, notepad. I will provide you with these uh, solutions um, after after we finish today. So, two. Diagram questions. We have the sketch the behavior of a uh, Maxwell viscoelastic model during creep and relaxation and include the 1D model that was proposed by Maxwell to represent the viscoelastic behavior of polymers. In the exam, you will need to, to, to draw a couple of um, graphs where you uh, represent some relationships or some theories um, that we discussed during the survey and um, something similar to that one. So for the maximum, we said that the graph looks like, okay, where this angle is equal here to sigma zero over the velocity. This is it. Zero over plus. Sorry, the axis in the in the creep we have constant and we measure the strain. Okay, so creep is constant. So the strain in this case looks like that, and the equation for the creep according to the Maxwell model is d over dt equals to sigma sigma over theta. And that equation is that not the the uh, creep behavior of a polymer. Does not describe this. On the other hand, the relaxation, the relaxation is essentially what we do is we keep uh, the strain constant and we calculate the stress that we need in order to maintain the strain constant, okay? So relaxation, that is a constant strain. We have the stress over time. And in this case, the equation looks like that. Okay. Here, this region is equal to E over E0, as expected. And the equation for uh, the Maxwell relaxation is given by sigma equals to sigma 0, sigma 0 exponent minus T. Zero. Which essentially describes an exponential decay of stress. Okay, and uh, as you remember, this describes well in uh, uh, the the relaxation behavior of polymers. Okay, and finally, the Maxwell model is given uh, we said that viscoelastic models are uh, are using um, are using 
combinations of springs and dust pots. So in this case, the Maxwell model, the viscoelastic model, is a combination of spring, let me see, spring and dashboard in series. Okay, that is 3.1. 3.2, sketch a name the two lamellar growth models of polymer chain folding. So, uh, where should I go? I should go here, 2.2. We have two main models of, uh, of polymer chain folding. If you remember, we said that we have adjacent reentry and non-adjacent reentry, okay? So in the adjusted reentry, we have a perfect, uh, let's say, arrangement of of the chains. So they look like that. They go in and out in the same spots, okay? And this is the adjusted reentry. And we have the non adjacent reentry or switchboard model, okay? So the switchboard model we can have some chains that look okay, but also we have chains that are completely going in and out in random positions, okay? So this is the switchboard. Okay. Now, uh, question number three. What was it? I don't remember. Sketch and briefly describe the stress strain curve of an SBS copolymer with 72% uh, butadiene content, 55% butadiene content, and 26% butadiene content. So we want the stress strain curves. Uh, 2 over 3, 2.3. So we have an SBS copolymer, which is essentially a combination of polystyrene and polybutadiene, okay? Polystyrene is a glassy polymer, stiff polymer. So any uh, polymer with any uh, block of polymer um, with a high content of polystyrene will be behaving similar to polystyrene, which is glassy. So uh, glassy behavior is essentially high modulus, brief, and, and uh, low toughness and high well, uh, if we have a uh, kind of behavior, polybutadiene is uh, elastomeric and it will behave as a rubber where essentially we can elongate a lot our material and uh, we have a high toughness and so on. So, will lead to a, a, a graph that looks like that. Okay. And essentially in this case, uh, polystyrene forms the dispersed phase. So we have a rubber 
like deformation. Okay, for B, where we have 55% of polybutadiene and 45% uh, of polystyrene, we will have a small amount of plastic deformation. So uh, the, the curve should look like that. Okay, we have much more uh, polystyrene in this case, so we can still uh, have more uh, higher modulus, and we um, we have plastic deformation in this case, as I said. So this is curve number B: 55% polybutadiene, 45% of polystyrene. So for case number B, we have. In this region, we have compositional symmetry. That's why it's called. OK? So we have the lamella structure. So in this case, we have deformation by necking and macroscopic okay it would be good or it would be beneficial if you uh, were mentioning in in each curve uh, characteristics such as let's say um, low modulus for a High toughness. Okay. In B, uh, have an average modulus um, and it is relatively strong or high strength. And now for the case of C, looks like that. Okay, so this seven polystyrene and twenty six percent polybutadiene. You can see that we have a, a highly uh, pronounced increase of the modulus as a result of um, of the polystyrene in there, sorry, stress strain. Um, let's put the units as well. Okay, so we see we have the strong material, which uh, of course cannot elongate a lot. It shows a, a slight uh, necking at the yield point um, because there is some amount of polybutadiene, it allows a bit of but generally uh, the polymer cannot get up. So in this case, we have uh, have a low elongation. High stiffness. What happens here also, I should point out, is that um, uh, the deformation takes place in two steps. First step is uh, the deformation of rubber domains. Second, essentially, addition of, of, uh, of the glass polymer, uh, it tries to do a, a micro neck, okay, but it, it, it does not form a, a, a long neck as you can see, it breaks very fast. So, we have the formation
okay? And that is uh, that is part two of uh, of this uh, this mock exam, okay? Now we don't have much time, so let's let's rush a bit. As I told you, I will I will provide you with uh, these answers on on current plus and uh, whatever we don't finish today, uh, I will briefly uh, show them uh, tomorrow uh, afternoon to you. So now let's go to question number three. Okay, in uh, in the exam as well, you will need to to justify and um, let's say think and discuss some phenomena that. Uh, are essentially have their basis on on what we discussed during the classes, uh, obviously on the on the content of polymer physics. Okay, for for the contents of um, of this mock exam, I selected some questions on polymer processing. So 3.1. So we have uh, a question that says when. Uh, complicated shapes are to be extruded. They are usually made from amorphous polymers rather than crystalline polymers. What does that mean? Why does this happen? Um, any ideas? Let me let me see if you have any ideas on the weak we come. I will give you one more minute if I don't see any answers. I'll go ahead and answer it myself because we don't have much time. No answer. Okay. Let me go. Let me go through. So what is a crystallization? Crystallization involves an orange segment polymer molecules. So for a given polymer, there is a involvement of uh, the coming from the melt to a uh, crystalline or a solidification, um, a solidification process. So crystallization in general uh, results in shrinkage. Okay. So, when a crystalline polymer is extruded, the associated shrinkage is uh, essentially taking place as the polymer it cools from the melt. So, that leads to part distortion. Let me write these things down. So, crystallization, what is crystallization? Is an orderly from disordered melt, okay? So when we have crystallization, what, what happens? We have a decrease in volume. Due to formation of crystallines. As you can realize, a crystalline, uh, a crystalline arrangement has much less volume than an amorphous arrangement. That leads to a pronounced shrinkage, and that can lead to part distortion, which is something that we certainly do not want when we extrude something, because part distortion can lead to uh, various sizes of the extrudate, and essentially we do not get the product that we want. Now, when a glassy polymer in this case we have cooling from a liquid, 
because glassy polymers do not melt, but they soften. So when we have cooling from liquid state, they have a gradual dimensional change. And that leads to very low shrinkage. So the graphs of volume over temperature for a crystalline polymer, this is temperature, volume, The amorphous polymer, sorry, uh, yeah, let me use a crystalline here. So for the crystalline polymer, it will look like that, okay? If here is room temperature and here is the processing temperature. Okay, so you can see that there is a large decree, decrease in volume, delta V crystalline, while in the case of the amorphous, we have small change that looks like that, and delta VA like that. There is room temperature, there is processing temperature. So, Delta VA is smaller than delta V crystalline, and that leads to this string. Okay. You got it. It has to do with uh, the orderly argument of God. A very low shrinkage, so we have almost no distortion. Okay. Now, uh, let me look at the question B. At least we finish this part. So, question B: Other comparable thermal conditions, extrusion rate is generally higher with amorphous polymers than crystalline polymers. Um, that has to do with, again, with the crystalline regions, okay? When we have crystalline regions, we need additional heat to break the intermolecular forces. At the end. That is a crystalline polymer. So, for the case of uh, an amorphous polymer, of course, uh, less heat is, is desired in order to soften the material because we don't have to break any any intermolecular bonding forces. Of course, we don't have a very well defined melting point, but we soften the polymer. So, if the thermal conditions are comparable. So we have thermal conditions extrusion rate Okay. And last question has to do with uh, the moisture 
Many extruders are now equipped with dehumidified hopper dryers. So dehumidification means to uh, essentially we want to eliminate moisture from the air. Okay. So many polymers, depending on their composition, of course, they absorb moisture from the air, and this can uh, result in steam formation. Let me write it down. Steam formation during extrusion. The steam needs to be fully released, of course, in order to extrude smoothly. Can result to even explosion. Okay, so that is why uh, um, several types of uh, extruders are uh, equipped with dehumidified hopper driver dryers. So essentially, uh, we feed uh, a completely dehumidified uh, pellet, and this um, because uh, we don't have any moisture, we don't have steam formation or pronounced steam formation during extrusion, and. Uh, don't uh, develop significant uh, along the extruder. Okay. Uh, I will provide you with the answer for the problem uh, tomorrow uh, morning for me, afternoon for you. I hope this was uh, slightly useful for you in order to start your uh, revision a bit. And I will see you tomorrow. Have a good evening and good to see you again. Bye, guys.